Hello, and welcome to the Ask the Industry Podcast, episode 128. I'm comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, this is the podcast where I interview the most influential people from the worlds of stand-up, comedy, radio, and today, character comedy and social media. Andrew Doyle is a writer, comedian, and creator of Titania McGrath, a social justice woke warrior on Twitter, who satirically mocks social justice, who has exploded in popularity on so many different mediums, and recently just did a run at the Edinburgh Fringe. To find out how a Twitter account managed to do an entire Edinburgh run, you're going to have to listen to this podcast. He also co-wrote the satirical news reporter Jonathan Pye on YouTube, and has a history of making things go viral, as well as creating things bigger than himself. We talked about the power of social media, comedy wokeness, quotas, the future of building your audience online, and the best way to get your first thousand fans on twitter i think there's a ton of lessons in here both good and bad i think there's so many things that comedians who want to build an online profile and presence can take from this to help their social media grow effectively and avoid some pitfalls maybe um speaking of which my book how to make a living by working for free is on sale where i interviewed comedians writers and musicians about how they built their online community through free content and then asked them to support them through donations it's five pound digitally and there's a link in the description it's perfect for anyone who wants to start building their online community before i hit play remember that if you're new here please do not forget to hit that subscribe button if you're old here please do consider to give us an honest ideally positive review in itunes and either way please do consider joining the facebook group it's called rc industry podcast and it's on facebook obviously but for now this is andrew doyle this is this is a weird one because there's two points i could start with and 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 maybe you want to tell me which one you prefer to start with um you're not a character well my stand-up persona is a character yeah Okay, because that was that was what I was a bit because because you are slightly different on stage to when I've spoken to you. Off yeah, stage. I am. Yeah, yeah. And so I didn't know whether you identify as a character or whether you. Identify. Yeah, it is a character. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe let's start there then. Okay. What? Well, well, it's it's a character based on me. Okay. Explain the difference. Because if I was just myself on stage, it wouldn't be very funny. So it is a uh, a characterization, a sort of perversion of of of, of who I actually am. So I sort of take some of my, usually my worst features and exaggerate them. Okay. Things like that. Or sometimes I just, the onstage me is much more bitter, uh, much more um, downtrodden, much more self-pitying. So that's the, that's the main difference. But I, no, because I always find it interesting because most people who are characters are very much completely different from what they are. Are they though? I mean, if you look at, if you look at Stuart Lee's onstage persona compared to who he actually is. It, it, it is I, I haven't spent a lot of time off stage with Stuart Lee. Okay, but it's, 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 it's obviously different, but it's not uh, a million miles away. It's, right. it's, it's it, you know, if you look at, um, uh, well, I think pretty much anyone, actually, if you think about it, uh, they have, when you perform stand-up, it's a performative thing. It's a theatrical thing. So you have to, you don't just say exactly, you don't just behave in exactly, Scott Kapoor would be another example, you know? Mm. I mean, like, if, if you... He has that sort of waspish quality off stage, but he certainly doesn't say the things that he would say on stage, and he certainly doesn't have that level of uh, uh, vitriol right. off stage. He's one of the most generous people I know. So, but you wouldn't know that if you watched him on stage, right? So, there's all these sorts of. I, in fact, I can't think of a stand-up who is exactly the same off stage and on stage. So, how long have you thought of yourself as a character? Well, since I've been doing stand-up. So you st- when you started, you thought, I'm writing this for the yeah. character of me. You didn't. Because I think when most people start, they just go, what's funny? They're just trying to grab for anything funny. Oh, actually, when I started, the, I, the, the performance I did on stage was, was very far different from me. Okay. More, more further than I am now. So I, I always saw it as a theatrical thing. I always saw it as essentially theatrical. You know, because, um, you know, I grew up watching Victoria Wood all the time. It was constantly... And she's, she was very different. She said a really interesting thing, actually, because I met her once and she was very prickly. And, mm. and, 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 not, she, and she said a really interesting thing on an interview. And I can't remember which one now, but she said, people see my stand-up and they see me and they assume I'm this very warm, uh, open person and they can come up and they can talk to me and everything. But she said that along the lines of, but I'm just not very nice. <laughs> and, they, and this is the interesting thing about her. You know, a, a complete genius uh, had cultivated this... this uh, this great on stage persona but that wasn't like who she really was mm. that to me is really interesting I, I um also i'm not a naturally funny person so if i stand on stage and just do just be myself it'll be pretty boring i i think i have to um i have to exaggerate and i have to write the scripts very carefully um and i have to cultivate the character very carefully okay that's interesting i because my, my first 
interaction with you, as in like before we met as comedians, yeah. was uh, 2012, I think. Was when, it? When you, we, this was online, so it wasn't, you wouldn't know. Did we have a row? No. Oh, okay. No, no, That's no. normally how I meet people online. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> no, 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 no. You had, well, you had a row with someone else. You had a row with a, an, edu- an audience member in Edinburgh, and you yeah. recorded it, and they threw a pint over you. That's right, yeah, yeah. And you uploaded that to the internet, and I and I don't know whether it was you who I saw it from, as in the share, yeah. or whether it was someone else, because I know it was floating around quite yeah, a lot. Yeah. And and I can't remember what the title of it was, but it was not clickbaity, but it was definitely something that would be more enticing than my five minutes at the comedy. Yeah, show. sure. Yeah. Right, and 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 from that point on, I remember thinking, oh, okay, because it sort of turned my head a bit, because by that point, everyone I knew was just putting up five minutes, like I said, you know, yeah. right, five minutes, and then the brackets, the name of the club. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and and since then, I've seen you incorporate social media into pretty much everything you do yeah and yeah. and sort of utilize it in a very interesting way for characters and for yourself yeah so so if you maybe want to walk me through like your thought process not uploading that in in that way and maybe yeah. how that's informed your social media that, presence since then well that gives you a good example that that i was at the caves that year yeah because no one no one knows who i am so i wasn't selling particularly well um that happened after i think the first week or something and things were slowing down ticket wise so once that was posted, I sold out the rest of the run. So, really? Yeah. I mean, it got 100,000 views sort of over the next few days when it was uploaded. So, yeah. So, and it sold out completely. And, it, and I knew this would happen because when I, I would ask members of the audience, it was quite an interactive show. So, mm. I would ask members of the audience, you know, who, who saw the video and most did. So, it was definitely in terms of marketing, in terms of advertising, that uh, straight away told me there was something quite successful about about doing that um it wasn't as cynical as that though i didn't make the decision to upload it it was the guy who was producing the show right and um he also did a very clever thing of 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 putting it through reddit as well um and that got very high up in the reddit charts of of the most viewed uh, posts Mm. so um but what that did teach me is that is that social media is a really effective tool uh to 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 market yourself really important tool actually uh and and it's the best way to put yourself out there because you bypass the media, you bypass everything. You get, uh, you can get a broader reach than mainstream media through the internet. So yeah, that's so yeah, and I have incorporated that ever since. And you, so you didn't, you didn't. That wasn't your choice. Do you, do you dislike that they were put? I mean, you obviously they, yeah, they said to you, "I'm going to put it up before I go put yeah. it up." Or is it a case of the next morning you're like, "Oh, it's sold out." How the hell did that happen? No, um, no, they did ask me if I. I mean, I was fine with it. Yeah, because I, you know, I also thought you came off well. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, th- I thought it was quite. I thought it was funny, uh, to be honest. So then, I, I thought that's a reasonable r- reason to put it up. Mm-hmm. I particularly like that during when, when the guy throws the beer, you can hear Scott Agnew shout at him. His very, yeah. very distinctive Glaswegian accent shouting at him, and he ran out after the, um, after the guy threw it, and they had a, a sort of a, a, an argument outside, and mm. it's all very dramatic. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that sold out your run. That's that's really yeah, impressive. Did. Yeah, yeah, because you were in. It was only a small venue, mind you know, it was, but it but it uh, yeah. made all the difference. So. But, but the fact you didn't have to fly it was a nice. Yeah, yeah, perk. exactly. Because I noticed because you also run Comedy Unleashed, the, yeah, the yeah. comedy club, and and that. Uh, I've, I don't know whether you're following a model of other clubs or whether you've done it independently, but I know, for example, Hot Water are kind of the model for uh, videoing acts and then putting them up online yeah. and doing that sort of thing. I mean, it took a while. Like, so Comedy Unleashed, it's taken about. Do you want to explain what Comedy Unleashed is for anyone? Yeah, yeah. So the night is, it's once a month in Bethnal Green at the Backyard Comedy Club and the the second Tuesday of the month. The purpose of the show is to just to say to the acts, look, we're not going to have just one type of political viewpoint represented here. You can say whatever you want. Don't self-censor, in other words. Don't worry about offending an audience. We don't believe that it's a safe space. We don't believe comedy should be a safe space. Um, And it means, and I get emails a lot of the time from comics saying, you know, I've got some material I'd like to try out, but I can't really try it anywhere else. And and that happens fairly regularly. So so the message is getting across. Um, because even though it, it's only a very small minority of clubs who will send you a list of rules about what you can mm. and can't say, um, that ethos is getting more and more uh, common, And um, which I don't have a problem with. I think if you want to run a night where you say you only joke about this or whatever, that's totally up to you. Mm. I don't have an issue with that whatsoever. So we're saying... Um, and also, it's a response really to the climate we live in because we live in this... The climate where most people, uh, not comedians particularly, uh, but people are nervous about what they say. Um, they're nervous about joking with each other at work, in the workplace. They're, they're nervous about being misinterpreted. They're nervous about tweeting and being misunderstood. So that everyone's playing it very cautious. And I understand that. Uh, I mean, I did it myself when I was a teacher. I knew full well that mm-hmm. there were certain things I would tweet and I'd get fired for. Um, uh, which is a shame and as comedians we don't have that problem as comedians we can say whatever the hell we want which is great you know i mean um, mm. we're so privileged in that sense but i also know if i wasn't a comedian uh, i wouldn't be saying everything that i want to say mm. uh, and that kind of 
climate of self-censorship is uh, a real problem and it is a problem for comedians as well because comedians want to get on tv they want to succeed they want to do all that sort of stuff and because the establishment the comedy establishment is so woke and is so uh, sort of guarded about the um the sort of artistic exploration of sensitive issues it means that uh, comedians do self-censor a lot of them do not all of them uh, of course um a lot of the ones i speak to do and they tell me about this and of course the ones who email me at comedy unleashed and say can i have a spot so um that's the sort of, that's <coughs> what, we're, what we're doing we're saying the audience we often get recurring people sometimes we get new people but but the host will always explain what the night is mm. it means that you don't get a situation where people are going to misconstrue something you say on stage and get offended and storm out or try and stop the show and the, the, the kind of things that happen every now and then not often but they do happen um the audience understands that that uh, part of the excitement of, 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 of the stand-up comedy event is the possibility that anything could be said and that maybe your sensibilities might be knocked a bit. Mm. That's part of the, the, the great... Th- that's the great thing about the art form. Is it, 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 it was one of the great things about the art form. So that's what we do. That's basically it. Uh, for, uh, we encourage free-thinking acts to come and just mm. uh, push themselves a little bit. Um, in practice, what that means is we just get good acts, you know? We just get good acts that play at other clubs and do similar sets at other clubs. And every now and then someone will come in and, and, and do something they don't normally do because they don't feel they can do it elsewhere. Yeah. Likewise, if there is a free speech issue in the media, we'll always defend it. So like if when Vanity Von Glo was banned from various uh, cabaret acts, I mean, seriously hurting her income uh, for standing up for free speech, we, we obviously had to book her. We, we, like, because if we, if we don't, who the hell will, you know? Mm. Same with Count Dankler, the guy who did the Nazi pug video. Once someone has a criminal record for a joke, you, we have a kind of responsibility to to have that person on our stage, I think, or at least to invite them, and and so that so we do we will do things like that as well. Mm. Um, so because within uh, obviously everything comes down to context and intent, yeah. and within the room that context and intent can be made clear, and it's obviously perfectly understandable. But when you because rec- you obviously record sets and put them out on the internet, yeah, yeah. And so I assume that when that happens, you maybe get more hate or maybe more backlash or there's I think the, the thing is that when people watch them they realise just how funny the clips are uh, right. pe- people are less likely to get annoyed or offended and also they but you know the internet is kind of I, I suppose we do get some yeah I mean particularly the Twitter account which I don't run actually but you get we get a lot of people going after after the, the, the person who runs the Twitter account and having a big go and all the rest mm. of it um, but you know that's the internet isn't it mm. it's a free for all yeah. And, and people people will decide to get I mean the people who hate the club the most are the people who've never been mm. and they've sort of decided that it's something it's not and they've they've got this sort of idea in their head that it's sort of a right wing sort of fascist night or whatever and that where it's people just doing Bernard Manning material or stuff and you know that's their prejudice and that's their problem um, uh, for me I never like to make any kind of judgement about a show or any anything unless I have direct experience of it because otherwise it's just guesswork isn't it yeah i always find that because i mean i remember uh, you know you've you've spoken about how uh, you've been called a nazi for example and you've been uh, sort of called right wing mm. in particular i think i think i even spoke to you about how because you wrote for spiked for a bit or i, think I still, do. You still do yeah, yeah i'm a communist and, and 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 that's caused people to think you're right wing um isn't that funny i mean that that again displays the level of ignorance that must be associated with that i mean um I, I always say this, but I do want to put this as a caveat, is that I don't think there's a problem with being right. No, not at all. And I, and I have a real issue with the way people now use that as, a, as a, an insult. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I, I, underst- I understand the narrative in the media is left is good, right is yeah, bad. Yeah, exactly. But, but I, I don't actually think... I mean, I've got... I've got sounds really stupid. I've got friends who are right. Yeah, right. yeah, but sure. Like, but that? like, I, you know, we don't agree on everything. But yeah. the, fa- the fun fa- the fact of life is you're not going to agree on everything. Right, right. And, and as long as they're not actively trying to hurt people, which, fair enough, some people in, on both sides are. You know, people, yeah, on, so people on my sides are throwing fucking milkshakes at people. Exactly. And I don't agree with that. So I'm not so, going to play yeah. that game. I'm not going to do this defensive thing saying, oh, no, I'm not right wing. No, you know, no. look at it. Like, I'm... I'm just objectively not, and I'm not. But I'm not going to worry if I if if occasionally some of my views would be classed as traditionally on the right. Fair enough. I don't care if that happens. It happens. I'm not going to just say I'm because otherwise it just comes down to tribalism. You say I'm on the left, mm. and so therefore I must believe this, 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 and this. Right? You've got a list of things that you must believe. Well, that means you're not thinking for yourself. That means mm. you're just a, a robot, and I don't want to do that. I, I would I would think about. I think very carefully about. My opinions, I, th- I read very carefully and I, I, I come to a conclusion. And I'm open to modify that conclusion subject to further uh, discussion. Um, that's I, that, that to me. Otherwise, I think you're j- it's just an intellectual death, mm. to be honest. So that's that's where I am at politically. But um, 
Yeah, what was your question again? It was, uh, it was I just lost how you were. I just <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, hello. Yeah, yeah, how are you? Um, now you're asking about being called a, a Nazi. So, I mean, well, that, that, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a combination. Uh, basically, it's all it's all wrapped around the difference between your online and offline you, personas. You were asking and, about and, spikes, actually. Uh, uh, well, I touched on that. Yeah, and, yeah. And it is interesting, isn't it, that that the, the the main criticisms from spikes either come from people who have never read it mm. and don't know what it is, or uh, these odd conspiracy theorists that go back to like 20 years who uh, when spiked used to be living Marxism magazine um, mm. and there was a big court case relating to uh, uh, the war in Bosnia and there are many disputes about the the details of that situation but the point is there are lots of grudges being held by people like Nick Cohen uh, at the Guardian pe- people who people like George Monbiot so who can't, they're stuck in the past and they're conspiracy theorists and they believe in this sort of living Marxism network of people, this revolutionary communist party network who infiltrate the TV and infiltrate radio and media and all this sort of stuff. And it, it's real tinfoil hat stuff. Mm. And so if you write for Spike, they go after you. Nick Cohen's gone after me a number of times. He's very angry at me for writing for Spike. And it's his problem. It's his personal grudge mm. that he's got with, with old uh, communists, I guess. Um, so so when, you, when you take jobs... Yeah. So like when you, because because I mean I was going to ask you about this as a general thing for for Titania and, and that sort of area okay. anyway. But when you when you get approached, but I assume you you didn't approach Spike, they approached you. Uh, yes, they did. Um, Tom Slater, who's the deputy editor, approached me to write a column for yeah. them. Um, in fact, the first time he asked me to write for them, I I did. I wrote an article or two, but I didn't want to do it, make it a regular thing, yeah. and I think that was largely out of cowardice because of the stigma attached to the publication, but not. The stigma isn't there, for instance, if you go to America. The, st- the stigma is only mm. there amongst a certain type of identitarian leftist in this country. Mm. Um, uh, it's the same with I, I've had debates. I've had I've seen people on this fringe do jokes about the Guardian, and then I've asked them, "How often do you read it?" And they go, "Ah, oh, just when there's like one column piece by a person." I, I, read, like, it you know I, mean? I yeah. read it every day. I read it every day. I still hate the Guardian, but yeah. I read it every yeah. day. Well, I yeah. have a I have a good knowledge of the Guardian. Yeah, I know yeah, it backwards. Yeah. Um, it is it is a, the equivalent of the it, 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 it's the Daily Express for the left. It is a tabloid. Uh, propagandist uh, bourgeois uh, Blairite rag basically and um, it, it isn't honest and it's in the in the stories it selects and it isn't and its opinion columns verge on the cultish to be honest so I but I but I say this out of experience I know this publication but I but I think that's I mean I, I mean while we're talking about cultish things mm. then I mean how repeat is your audience for comedy unleashed could you could you expand the night and could you uh, could, could you yeah I think it's it, you know, it took a while to to grow a uh, a base that come back repeatedly, but they won't come every month. And then no. every time Ria, Lena, or whoever is hosting that particular night, she re- hosts quite a lot. Um, she'll say, you know, who, uh, who's been before, and it's always actually about half and half, which is quite nice because it means we are always getting new people in, but we're also got a kind of base that come back every now and then to the night. So. Uh, yeah, so that's that's quite good in a way, but yeah, it's certainly something we could expand. We're talking about it. Mm. No, but I wondered whether because uh, a lot of nights, uh, little independent nights, especially that are only run monthly, for example, yeah. have an audience that pretty much not every month, but they've got they've got a core cool base that will come every month, and then there's sort of a rotating cast of people. Yeah. And so, for example, you can't book people. You maybe MCs on a regular basis. But you can't book acts on a regular basis because no, no, we can't. We, we so we we. MCs are different. So like yeah. Dominic Frisbee or Rialina or people who we have back to MC. That's okay. We don't, but we don't want people... Jeff Norcott's done it a number of times, but but there's always like a good four months between each mm. appearance. Uh, Scott Capuro, likewise. Um, uh, Jojo Sutherland's done it a couple of times. Um, so people have come... Yeah, we, you know, Issa Bonacera we've had a number of times because we think she's brilliant. We, we, we have... Um, but who's, we, who's we? Who are you, I thought me you... and Andy Shaw who run the night. Okay. Um, so we have, um, we yeah, exactly. We we don't. We try to have different acts. We try to hmm. you know mix it up a bit, and we want the audience to have a different experience every time they go. We want every night to be unique. Yeah, I presume there's a, a, not like a normal club, a progression ladder. It's just you like them, you book them, you pay them. That's it. Uh, sort of. I mean, we do a lot of research into the acts there first, and also it, it's it's about. <laughs> It's about whether I want them and Andy want. It's about whether we agree, right? Uh, basically, um, so that's that's the way we do it, and um, yeah, and and we've we've started uh, getting people back, but only after a few months. Like that's the point. We we don't have them, yeah, immediately after each other. The only obje- uh, exception is the Christmas show last year where we had everyone was doing just five minutes. It was just yeah. a fun night, and it was we were packing as many nights. 
mm. acts in at once. But even that's a different yeah. kind of show, isn't it? Yeah. And do you do you find the same as you did with that viral video of your own? The 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 videos encourage people to come back, or is it? Yeah, I think so. I think they. Um, yeah, I think that. I, I mean, I don't know to be honest how much that has helped the uh, the marketing. I mean, Andy's the one who's really on top of all of that sort of stuff, so he will have, probably have some data on that because he sort of he's quite he's quite rigid on that. He'll check stuff out. Mm. I don't know, maybe. Uh, they seem to get a good chair, so they seem to get reach quite yeah, an no, audience. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, I find it really interesting when I talk to clubs generally about social media because a lot of them have a similar response to you even the ones that are on top of it they yeah. go we don't know if it's making a difference but we know that we're at least we feel like we're out there well the good thing about it is it's good for the acts right it means right. they've got a video online they can then post to people and say uh, you know this is something I do um, but do any of them like you were spiked not want to send it because of the reputation of the club to people that haven't few. played it do you know what I mean yeah a few yeah yeah. So is that is that annoying well, it's up to them um, it's it's I understand it I mean but that's sort of this is what I was going back to what I talked about about this climate where people are afraid to to put their head above the parapet. This is the climate we we live in now, and and I often get messages from people saying I really like what you do, but I'm I'm not going to retweet it or I'm not going to be public about that. And um, it, you know that is a shame, but I also understand it. You know, I get it. Yeah. Um, I hope that the culture will change, that people will stop behaving in such an infant infantile way and and just assuming that anyone who disagrees with them is evil. Hopefully, we'll get to that point at some point. I mean, mm. where we are at the moment is that it's it's not just the politically naive who say that. It's it's actually some of the smartest people have bought into this really tribalistic worldview, and it's it's very sad. Uh, mm. And it's and it's it's anti enlightenment, and it's uh, it's it does represent the infantilism of our culture. It's a shame. It's a shame. So hopefully, we'll move beyond that. Okay. So so what so while we're talking about raising our heads above the parapet and, yeah. and sort of p- putting your neck out. Um, uh, briefly let's talk about Titania and okay. we'll sort of talk about her now and then talk about the show a little bit later yeah. so Titania is is uh, ostensibly a Twitter character but has yeah. become more than that yeah yeah um, I don't mean to downplay I just mean where it started yeah yeah sure and oh, it's not downplaying it that's exactly where it started no yeah. I know I know but I yeah I'm, I'm overly paranoid about insulting your work that's why I just don't worry me. you can okay. slag it off if you like okay no I like it I Great. follow it it's okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, no I I, uh, I find it really interesting that that uh, especially when people found out you write it yeah. as a man, yeah. there was a, there was an issue with that. Yeah, yeah. And I always find, uh, I mean, I've heard you talk about how it's a character and you can write characters for any gender or race or creed or whatever because yeah, it's course, a character yeah. thing. But, I've, but I find it, I, I wonder whether if you said the same thing on your Twitter feed, yeah. would, you, would you get more backlash? And is that why you've created this so that you can say things that you have written in your head for you, but you think, oh God, there's, there's a climate here that won't allow a man to well, say it. It wouldn't work for me though, because, and because the character is so different from who I am. Right. It, it wouldn't make sense for, for me to start going on about how we need to ban everything and and you know uh, the, the, it has to come through a character that kind of thing right. it's 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 uh, it only works uh those sort of sentiments only work if you are an authentic sort of uh, intersectional fourth wave feminist uh, activist or it's a character taking the piss out of those people that's the only way it works i you know I, I so it just simply isn't something i could do through my own voice when you when you made that twitter account mm. and it had no followers yeah how did you build that from nothing Oh, good question. No one's asked me that. Um, I saw early on. I started in April last year, and the point for me was just I was just entertaining myself really, but I wanted to sort of poke fun at the the social justice movement and um, largely out of frustration. Why? Why? Because because uh, I I've always been committed to things like g- genuine social justice, anti racism, anti homoph- uh, anti homophobia, uh, equality, equality of the sexes, all the rest of it, and we've now got a movement that makes all those all those causes look stupid and that's a problem so um and we've got a movement that is determined to divide us all up to undo the great work of the civil rights movements of the 60s and 70s to to uh, rehabilitate racism to make us a more racist society inadvertently i should say um all of that stuff is incredibly damaging and i think it's uh, the best way to deal with it is to take the piss out of it because it is funny because it's a bourgeois movement because it is so dominated of course not exclusively so dominated by people who are sort of privately educated and have this sort of middle class background um and yet believe they are these sort of oppressed underdogs it's very difficult to penetrate it's a very kind of they're very powerful people there's not many of them but they're so disproportionately powerful so it is a hard thing to and they're funny you know some some posh person who was privately went to bloody 
I don't know, Brighton College or something, really posh, who writes for The Guardian, who then turns around and says, I'm so oppressed, and then writes a book about what how, what an oppressed person she is. And then, you know, there was another book about similar Guardian columnist, independently wealthy millionaire, grew up in Wimbledon, writes about how she wished she'd grown up in a council estate, that would have been better. And, you know, all this kind of stuff, It it it, it it's it's funny. Ultimately, it's funny when, when people who are so privileged are determined to tell other people that they're the oppressors and they're the... Mm. It's, it's just, it's so daft. Yeah. No, that reminded me, I, I just saw Jeff Norcock's um, Middle Class Ruin Britain or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the documentary. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. really well done. Yeah. Really well put together. I never really... He got a lot of flack for it. Did he? <laughs> yeah. I really want to talk to him about it because mm. I... I I've never come into contact with him really before that, and mm. I remember there was one bit where he was in the council estate there where he grew up, yeah. and he was and he says, "I tell all my friends it was better back then when I grew up here, but everything I do is trying to make sure my kids don't grow up here." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and so when you say someone really independently wealthy who goes, oh, "I'd be lovely to be in a council estate," yeah. you sort of think maybe watch just that thirty seconds. Well, she's fetishizing it, isn't she? And she that's you know, the problem. Yeah, know, yeah, and it's um, and it's. You know, I mean, uh, I suppose I shouldn't name names, but you know, she's she's a a person who has had utter privilege, uh, but be, but because she's a person of color, she believes that instinct in, in instantly makes her an oppressed victim. And it's very funny when someone has all of this money. This is not to say she hasn't faced racism. Oh no, not at all. The point is that to deny the sheer advantages, the sheer the the way in which the uh, the odds are stacked in your favour if you come from that sort of background. With that, I mean, really, this is the main problem with, with identity politics in, it, in its current form. Is it? It is pretty blind when it comes to class issues, um, and in fact, it's 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 sort of actively hostile to them. Mm. And the reason for that being, of course, that most of the people who perpetuate it are very very privileged financially. So it's in their interest not mm. to sort of skirt over that main issue. But ultimately, you know, I've I've taught in private schools and posh schools. You know, if you're a, um, a, uh, a a black lesbian who goes to one of the poshest girls' schools in the world, you're still pretty fine, right? You're still, you know, this isn't to say you won't face misogyny and everything, but you're not, you're not in the same position as were you to go to some rough state school. You know, it's just not the same thing, right? These girls used to come into school and talk about how they've just been, they've just got an internship at GQ because daddy's sort of put a word in and all this. They have no idea, right? So they don't know what it's like to not be able to afford to get the bus basically mm. so that will never happen to them um so it's about so this this sort of misapplication of privilege um is something i was interested in satirizing i think it's i think it's just funny so how did you get your first thousand followers yeah that was the question you actually yeah. asked wasn't it um don't know i decided early on she was a slam poet i put out the poems always used to do very well um you know what it is? It's to, it's when you get amplified by people with many followers. That's the way to do it. Mm. Uh, and I would often reply to people who were quite well known, or I would uh, quote tweet people who were quite well known. Now, if they got it got in on the joke, they would sometimes retweet it, and that really amplifies you. Um, at the time, the Godfrey Elfwick ca- account was still up and running, and that was. Um, the genderqueer Muslim atheist character on Twitter who's been completely banned and will never go back, but a sort of legendary Twitter persona who was a, a very sh- sharp, satirical thing, run by two people. One of them is now a friend of mine, Lisa Graves. And at the time, Godfrey was still active and he retweeted Titania a lot and used to say things like about when he met Titania at a slam at poetry event and all this sort of stuff. Um, and of course, he had many followers, almost 100,000 followers. So that mm. boosted it as well. Um, and then what really boosted it was about, I think about three months in, four months. No, a bit later. It was September, I think. Uh, she got, she'd been banned about, I'd had a number of one-day suspensions, about three or four one-day suspensions and two seven-day suspensions for quote-unquote hate speech. Um, and then I got the permanent ban from Twitter, which meant that I got... Um, whenever anyone went to the account it came up as account suspended now by that point i had enough high profile followers particularly in america on your account or her account? on her account okay um and they started tweeting about it and you had some quite sort of big presences on twitter saying effectively look this is proof that twitter is an ideological a partisan entity it doesn't want to be mocked because twitter's so woke like the people who the people who work in those sort of san francisco uh, tech giant company they're so super woke this was a character that was taking the piss out of their worldview and they took this opportunity to ban her. Mm. So then you have lots of commentators pointing this out and saying, look, this is evidence that Twitter is partisan. So within 24 hours, the account was restored. And I can't help but think it's that Twitter realized that it was being used as ammunition against them. 
That's the mm. only reason I can think that happened mm. uh, because it's unprecedented. I don't know of any case where they've they've undone a permanent ban. You know, because right. um, appeals mean nothing to Twitter. It, it's never it's, it never works. So, so do you think? Then she got twenty thousand followers the next day, right. off the back of the ban because because of the Streisand effect, as you know. Whenever you try and censor something, this is why I'm, one of the reasons I'm totally anti-censorship. It draws attention to bad ideas. Mm. Basically, it, it, it gives them currency and it allows them to breed. So, um, yeah, so that's you, what happens. So, do you, and I mean this in a nice way, do you yeah. now think you're bulletproof on Twitter with that account? No, no, no. Because surely. surely they can never take it down because then they'll just say again, look, they're censoring them again. So, surely no, you, I'm that creative license is made, no? I'm bulletproof insofar as I don't care if they ban me. Okay. Like at this point, I've written the book. I've done yeah. the show. There's other avenues I'm exploring. I, I is that what you wanted from it? A book originally, or was it just uh, for fun? No, that wasn't even my idea. That that came out from the my agent uh, contacted me because the, um, the publisher he he often works with was interested in something about wokeness, right. and so my agent said to me, you know, what, do you think you might be able to do something about wokeness? And I said, um, well, I've got this character. Coincidentally, I've only been doing it a couple of months, and she's this woke slam poet. And my agent had been following her without knowing it was me because I hadn't told anyone. Mm. I mean, I literally hadn't told anyone. And so, and then I got the book deal out of that. And then when she was permanently banned, what happened? Because of all the publicity, because then it became a news story, we just moved the publication date f- forwards a few months. And, and I pretended as the character that I'd written it in my 24 hours off Twitter, which of course is just a yeah. joke. But um, so, All of it's just a joke. Yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. The book was ready to go anyway. But yeah, so if they ban me now... You know, that's all right. Your book sales will go through the roof. It will help, but also it'll be a bit of a relief. Then I can just concentrate on other things, right? It's not, mm. it doesn't bother me if that happens. Um, but they probably, and I think they will at some point, you know, it's so arbitrary, this stuff. Yeah, I mean, she, uh, the, the character's essentially become a tulpa because now it's a show, it's a real person yeah, who yeah. plays, you know, the, the character. Yeah. And, and I, I suppose the interesting part for me for that is, you know, it's such a, an online thing and yeah. such an ethereal thing. Yeah. How hard was it to transfer this 100 or 280 character thing? Yeah. A, to a book, which I suppose is just like a longer, maybe a longer dry tribe of, of, of tweets or maybe an it's not. No, oh, it's, it? okay. it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, it's separated into uh, 20 odd chapters, each one dealing with a different theme right. and interspersed with examples of her slam poetry. Um, so it has, a, it has a very clear, definite structure. You have to think structurally when you do these sort of things. You know, yeah. it's not it's not like a tweet. Um, the, a tweet is effectively like the, has the impact of a one liner, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, although with her, it's not just about the one liner. Sometimes it's about trying to bait people into responding and taking it seriously. That's the other thing mm. that it does. Um, and likewise with a live show, it has to have an arc. It has to have a structure to it and all of that. So it's a different kind of thing. Um, and um, yeah, it is. It is. It is difficult. And also, you you we did a big casting process, and Alice Marshall, who plays her, is utterly brilliant. And she obviously she brings her own interpretation to the to the character as well. So all of that is uh, is really interesting to me. Mm. No, I I the the you said you mentioned your agent. Mm. How did you find your agent? How did I find my agent? Well, this is a literary agent. I'm talking, I've got two agents. I've That's got, fine. I've got a comedy agent and a literary agent. Well, we can talk about both because you're a writer and a comedian. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it was through my spiked articles. He uh, he re- read a lot of my articles and really liked them and wanted and approached me and said, you know, so it's a right wing agent. No, I'm no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, That's the weirdest thing, isn't it? With spiked, I mean, spiked is a Marxist. Left wing. I, I was joking. It's weird. I was only, though, I was only joking. I was only joking. I love it. I love that people because it is. It's anti-Trump. It's anti-Tory. I can't think where people are coming from. Anyway, look, yeah, I yeah, just yeah. don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, he approached me. He was saying that I might be interested in writing a full-length book about politics mm-hmm. and it's certainly about identity politics, which I'm probably going to do next. I think that's my next thing because I, I feel like with Titani, that's the satirical approach, and I want to take the polemical approach, which is what I do either on TV or in in um, in the articles that I write. So um, I want to write something serious about this stuff because I think it's a really serious issue. Mm. I think uh, the rise of the woke movement is 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 divisive. It is feeding the far right, which is a particular concern of mine. Um, and so we've got to do something about it. And I, so I'm not, not, not suggesting that I'm going to be able to do it, but I, I feel like at least I could contribute to the discussion. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's how I got here. He, he, he contacted me. I find that with agents largely, isn't it, that they like to feel they're doing the chasing. I'm not saying that of my agent, by the way. That sounds mm. a bit mean. But I think my experience in the past with agents is if you chase, particularly comedy agents, I think if you're chasing mm. them all the time, that puts them off. 
how did that so so it just emailed you and then you met for a drink like yeah. what what's the process of getting a literary agent for your perspective was this your first literary agent or is it no 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 I, okay I, i've had an, a few okay um i think that was in this case yeah we, he dm'd me on twitter that was all that was right. and then uh, we met for a drink and that was that only just signed off the top yeah, of that s- as simple as that and what made you and you maybe don't want to name who they are but what made you leave the previous agents what were the red flags for you or what or what made that not work um the first agent I had just wasn't very proactive. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think this is the case with most agents, actually. I'm very lucky at the moment. I've got two very good agents who are proactive. But the my experience in the past has been people who, they will basically sit back and wait for you to get the work. And, and they'll get wait for you to get the opportunities. And they will focus on their, their acts who have already have a large reach and they're making more money off them, obviously. But of course, that's counterproductive, what they should be doing. Good agents will invest in new talent who aren't going to make the money in the short term, but will make the money in the long term if they if they if they're far sighted. Mm. That's the way it should be. Um, you know, and they can be they can be really great, or they can be useless. And it's always it, I don't know how useful it is for people to be with an agent who is doing nothing for them. What did what what did your agent say they saw in you? Like, what plan do they have for you? Or did they come to you and say? I want to work with you. What do you want to make? Like, what was the I think, who, who works for who? In other words, I think he was interested in in the way in which I write in an argumentative way. I think he was interested in, in um, that I've got a lot of experience in, in 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 rhetoric, and and it was the the idea that I was expressing ideas that he had felt mm-hmm. in a way that he considered to be an, an elegant style, and that that it would it would suit a a full length prose piece. Mm. That was the I think that was his feeling about it. Mm. Um, you know, there's also the awareness that the like the publishing industry, for instance, is very, very woke, and that the fact that we got the Titani book published is <laughs> by a mainstream publisher is pretty astonishing. Mm. Um, so you're, but if you, you know, but that's why you need an agent who is on board with what you're saying and understands and gets what you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's um, also my the agent had done some previous political books, right, and had worked with people like Douglas Murray and people who would you know. And, and so had some sort of background in this kind of writing. And it just so happens that the first book I ended up doing with him was a comedy book, which wasn't actually the original plan. Uh, that's just, So that sort of put everything on hold. So now I'm sort of going to go back to, to that. I'm going out um, to, I'm going away for two weeks after, straight after the fringe. And I'm going to be, compl- I'm going to isolate myself as I always do when I go to write. I just completely isolate. I go to a, uh, an island called Sark which is very there's no cars allowed in Sark. it's in the channel islands okay but you can't there's no cars allowed there so it's very quiet you just occasional horse you know right. and and um there's no there's 500 people live there there's no one around you can you can cycle to the other end of the island in half an hour it's um it's really peaceful but also weirdly inspiring it's not beautiful in a conventional sense it's beautiful in a kind of scary gothic sense you know very steep drops everywhere it's the highest of the channel islands it doesn't have those sort of bays you know gradual slopes down it's these sheer drops absolutely everywhere it's got these twisted gnarled trees that look like fingers because the winds are so strong and it's 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 a very interesting place just to go and i sit at the top of a cliff every day with a laptop and write and that's what i've been doing that's how i wrote the titania book right i went there to do that i just need that sort of piece but i'll go out there and i will just write politics and that's all i will do and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna think about comedy i'm not gonna crack a smile the whole time that's my view okay yeah and how about your comedy agent? How did you meet them? Uh, my current comedy agent, and I have had different ones in the past. My current comedy agent, I got while I was working. Well, I wrote with Jonathan Pye for three years for the character of Jonathan Pye. So you don't write together anymore? No, no, no. Okay. Um, and uh, I think what had happened is the like Tom's agent, Tom who plays the character, uh, wanted me to come on board as well because it makes sense and, it, yeah. and and things are much easier that way uh and now i'm with that agent although tom's no longer with that agent so mm. that's it's so that was more to do with work i was already doing to be honest mm. okay and what about your previous agents and how 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 did they go why why didn't they work out is it a similar reason yes yeah, like the pre- like really n- nice people just just weren't doing much for me Okay. Basically. Yeah. No, I, it's always interesting to hear the perspective of the performer and yeah. find out what maybe your red flags were, what, because, uh, because most people, as you know, maybe when you, you know, when you first start out, yeah. the big thing is, I just need to get an agent because they open doors, they'll get they you on do, TV, they, they do, do that. I think that's uh, over, I think people worry too much. It is that. overrated. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think yeah. it's, it's, a, it, the, the, the key thing that people should do is just do their work and, and express themselves and, and create the, the work they want to create. 
And if there's a market for it, the market will open up mm. um, rather than trying to anticipate what the market is and trying to anticipate what agents want. Mm. I find that's very, uh, it, it rarely works yeah. because you can't anticipate the zeitgeist. Yeah. I, all I've ever, I've always been in terms of the work I produce and stuff, it's, it's, it's always been just whatever I've wanted to do with a consciousness that the stuff I'm doing isn't very fashionable. Like mm. I've never really hit the fashionable zeitgeist at, at the right time. I've never done that. I think Titan is the only exception probably, you know, where, where there's been a, a hunger for this kind of thing. Mm. But I didn't do it cynically because I, I sensed there was that. I just did it and it just happened. See, that, that's interesting is because I think, especially because we're at the Edinburgh Festival at the moment. Yeah. And here I've seen, I've dropped, dropped into compilation shows and I've seen a few things. And you do get the vibe that some people are doing what they think will sell on TV yeah, or course, get them on TV. And and personally, I've, I've never, I, I just don't see the point in that. No, it's stupid. And and I was, a, a, a reporter for The Independent asked me this in an interview. She said, um, you know, is it a bit cynical that you're marketing this show as being sort of anti-woke at, at, a, at a time where that seems to be getting a lot of press? And I'm thinking, well, how else would I market it? That's exactly what the show is. And why do you think it's getting a lot of press? There's only like three or four of us doing this kind of stuff on mm. the fringe. There's 3,000 shows or whatever. It's not like this is some big thing. Mm. And, and you know, Titania is part of that, part of the reason it's in the press, right? So mm. it's a really weird question to ask, actually. Um. Time for a break, but fuck me if we covered a lot in this interview. He takes on quotas, comedy policing, the future of the industry, which all have really interesting perspectives, and his writing process, which we get into more later on in the podcast. I really enjoyed hearing everything that goes in behind the scenes to create just a single tweet and, and, and an audience and how he capitalizes on their attention to sell tickets and merch and books and everything. I'm really loving putting this one together. As always, here comes your mid-roll ad. If you want to kill the ads and get rid of them, you can go ad-free from $1 on Patreon. That's 80p. That's nothing. You, you must be able to afford that. That's so cheap. You can sign up in the time it takes to listen to this advert. It's literally 90 seconds. And if you can only do it for a few months, that's perfectly fine as well. Anyone and everyone for any amount of time at any amount of money really helps this show continue. So please check out patreon.com forward slash ask the industry podcast. The link's in the show notes. Here's your advert, you freeloader. And we're back. I hope you have a notepad ready because the amount of social media advice in the next section is massive. Let's dive back in. Anyway. No, no, that's, uh, I, I get what you're saying. It's, it's, I mean, it comes down to, um, I suppose it's weird because they, they'll, they'll ask that question, yeah. but then they will avoid asking questions about quotas, which is essentially the same thing where they've, where they've said there is where they've said, you're, you're a small group of people doing yeah. a thing, so you're fitting into a, a niche. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's getting elevated. Is that a good thing? And it's sort of like, with a quota surely that's similarly to, similarly to what's happening they're going okay we'll have this group of people and we'll elevate them yeah. because they're this small and we, and we haven't been helping them out before and I wondered where you stand on quotas and where you stand on uh, uh, sort of trying to elevate voices and, and a, a quota system is an admission of uh, prejudice so um, it, it's important when there are historical situations for instance an example I've given before, but it's a good one, I think, is like the, the PSNI, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, formerly the RUC, Royal Ulster Constabulary, who uh, had a history of, of being an um, overwhelmingly Protestant force that would, would uh, terrorise uh, Catholic individuals, particularly in the 60s and 70s in, North, in Derry and Belfast. So you've got, uh, you've got a situation where, in order, particularly with the febrile political climate in Northern Ireland, you have to institute some kind of quota system. You have a kind of institutionalised prejudice against Catholics, which is demonstrable on the basis of, of historical evidence. So you have to bring in quotas or something to ensure that we get some more Catholic police. So they had to do that. And and that's that was the right thing to do. So in that sort of situation, I would support it. Um, when a TV um, a broadcaster starts uh like when the bbc advertised internships for non-whites only what they are saying there is that they believe that their uh employers are racist uh which is an odd admission to make especially because i don't think it's true um it's it's just simply not the case um so no i'm against those sort of quote system i think it's patronizing to minorities uh i think if you are secure uh that you are uh, you know, not a racist organization, then you don't, or not a homophobic organization or whatever, then you don't need those things. Um, the, the, the reason they do it is because they believe in these 
uh, invisible power structures in society and this idea of unconscious bias, uh, which, is, which is a complete bunkum as far as I can... I mean, we all have a million unconscious biases. Uh, it's, it, I'm not interested in how people... Uh, the biases that people... I, I'm interested in the way people behave. That's what matters. And so these, these, these sort of quasi-religious viewpoints, which have been totally taken from the woke culture, have infected things like uh, the major broadcasters and the arts generally. Um, they're not true. Uh, there is no evidence for them, but but they nevertheless are taken as... I mean, let's give an, a good example from this week. The Advertising Standards Authority banned two adverts, one for cheese, one for a Volkswagen Golf vehicle, on the basis that, for instance, the Volkswagen ad advert depicted a woman next to a pram. And they banned it, saying that this was perpetuating harmful negative stereotypes, presumably the stereotype that some women have prams and have babies, mm. which is true. And they look after them. And they look after them, <laughs> right? So it's not... It's, uh, and they banned the cheese advert because it depicted the idea that men weren't good parents or something. Anyway, look, and the only reason that makes sense is if you believe that putting these messages out there uh, has this trickle down effect in society and warps everyone's minds. It's this very paternalistic patronizing idea of, of, of normal people. That's really and that comes from the woke movement. The woke movement don't believe that normal people, let's just say honestly, working class people can be trusted to know the difference between a joke and real life, to know the difference between an advert and real life, and that they'll, they're just these sort of malleable creatures that just do whatever they're programmed to do. It's a really pessimistic view of humanity and I don't subscribe to it. Um, but look, there you have it, the ASA, Advertising Standards Authority, a quango which, is, which is, has an awful lot of power because the, it's, been, uh, it's been given that power by the government, can arbitrarily decide that this faith-based position on the basis of, of media representation is going to be implemented and it's going to affect us all now. And they're going to ban adverts. It's a joke and it shouldn't happen. And actually what the government needs to do is scrap these quangos because they are so overwhelmingly woke. Mm. And is that your similar opinion in comedy? In what sense? As in quotas in comedy. I don't think they're necessary. I think they would be necessary if, for instance, you could point to a specific promoter who has an obvious record of only hiring men, for instance, uh, then in that sort of case, I would I would support some sort of quota system. Uh, you know, that isn't happening very much as far as I can see, you know, particularly with the well, particularly not on, on television. It's not it's, it's certainly not happening. Um, but so, no, I, uh, broadly speaking, I don't support it. But actually, even come to that thinking about it. If someone wants to run a night where it's only men, that's up to them as far as I can see. Uh, likewise, we have nights for any women and what, you know, I just wouldn't go to that sort of night. It doesn't interest me if you, you know, I want to. See, I, I book people on the basis of whether they're good or not. That's it, and whether they're free-thinking comics, and whether and 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 whether they're interesting comics, and whether they're willing to take risks. And as a result, the, if you look at the comedy unleashed back back catalogue, we have just the, about the most diverse range of people you'll get. Because the, if you focus on meritocracy, you end up uh, having parity anyway. That's the point. Hmm. Yeah. No. I I I find all these quotes really interesting, and and I and I sort of move around whether I feel good or bad about them. Well, look, I if, don't... if someone booked me and said, I want you on this panel show because you're gay and we need a gay person, I would almost certainly say no. That was going to be my next question. Right. I was going to ask, A, have you ever benefited from a quota? And B, have you ever felt like you have been booked because of one? Uh, no, I, I think I've not been booked because of it, because insofar as there used to be this feeling that we've got one gay act on, we don't want a second gay act on. I think a lot of female comics who I've spoken to feel the same way. So historically, there have been night certain promoters who will be like well we'll have just one woman this stuff isn't good uh i don't support anything like that but i also don't support uh imposing quotas to to make sure it doesn't happen uh, mm -hmm. i think the best way to do it is to is to just um you know try and promote the idea that we should all just book on the basis of merit uh and then what will happen is naturally these things will resolve themselves because most promoters aren't these sort of bigots are they they're not really you've got a few old has-beens who have that quality well that's fine it's no big deal if we just avoid them is it mm. you know it's no big deal if you don't get booked by them like get booked by the people who why, why would you want to work for someone like that I, I, you know, I, I don't think I would. Have I ever benefited from a quota? I've been booked for gay gigs, exclusively gay gigs, which tend to be awful. Um, the the only exception is Zoe Lyons' Bent Double Night, which is brilliant, but that's because it's it's not just, you know, you get loads of straight people in there as well, you get gay people in there. It's just a kind of, it's got a sort of gay ethos. It has a historical kind of gay ethos in Brighton, which strikes me as a reasonable thing to do. Um, it, it certainly isn't exclusionary to straight acts or to mm. straight to straight audience members you know so that that sort of thing's kind of fun um 
but no, I've done. I did a terrible LGBT night in at the Leicester Comedy Festival. With the, like it was, it was the kind because I think the problem as well is a lot of the LGBT community, if such a thing exists, have a kind of um, uh, have have bought into this woke bullshit, and as a result, are their ears are pricked for any kind of indication that they should be offended by something. You know, that and and so you get that very kind of Mary White House style. It's like performing to a bunch of Mary White Houses sometimes. Mm. So uh, on the whole. I, I just prefer to uh, my, my view of all this stuff is I would not like to benefit from these kind of quotas and um, if I suspected that I was I would probably do something about it do you want to be famous no because I, I find it interesting that your characters and the characters you've worked on like like Jonathan Pye and like Titania yeah are on the face of it at least more well known than you yeah 100% they are yeah much uh, better much better that way uh, yeah is, is that a conscious move on your part I have no interest in fame and I, not only that I don't understand people who do I don't get it right I don't know why you would want that um, it, the idea that you, you should be validated by the more people who would recognise you strikes me as very shallow and, and very and, and must be the result of some kind of insecurity um uh, I mean, I know we all have a sizable ego, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we do. Of course, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, and, and, and I, I you know, obviously I'm, I'm not going to deny that if someone comes up to me and says, oh, I like what you do and everything, I will enjoy the compliment. You know, I'm not, I'm a human being ultimately, and I do have an ego. Uh, I think it's always good to keep that ego in check. And, but I, I'm not interested in, in, uh, in fame for its own sake. No, not, not at all. All I want really is to have the freedom to, to be creative, to the, my creative freedom. I, I want the freedom to make what I, the, the works that I want to make, to write the things I want to write, and to be financially stable enough to do that. Mm. And of course, the fame element, like, the more people know about you, the easier that becomes, of course. So that's the, you know, that's why I'm not going to turn down when, you know, if I'm invited to go on television and things like that. I do it, partly because I want to express my views on things. That's partly what I, you know, that it's very satisfying. I really enjoy that. Um, but also I'm aware that it, it will enable me to sell more tickets and, and ultimately I, I'm, I don't come from a wealthy background so I have to um, I have to be aware of that and I, I need to cultivate a following in order to be able to make the work that I want to make mm. that's my only priority there okay so so you've done like TV shows where you are able to go on and be you I assume yeah. you're not playing your character then no no no, no, no no I do, like, I do Sky News every two yeah, weeks yeah, yeah, and yeah. stuff and I, and I go on various things to talk about issues no 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 that's me yeah, yeah. that's no. that's me 100 percent. yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just i'm just distinguishing between the two yeah sure but i'm not trying to be funny there that's the, that's the other thing is that's, that's often, what i was gonna say they often introduce me as writer and comedian and then you think oh but why aren't you making any jokes i'm because i'm being myself that's what i was gonna ask because yeah. uh there's, there's a lot of cases of people who do let's say a sitcom character yeah. or they go on a, a panel show or something yeah. and people come expecting something else at a show yeah sure and I'm wondering whether you found people coming from watching you on Sky for some reason and are expecting almost almost in a way no jokes just some sort of dry you know political yeah. rant or something has, has that ever happened is that happening to you I remember Paul Sinner mentioning to me about like a lot of his fans the fans who come to his show now are Chase fans okay. so you kind of get so there's a slightly different expectation mm. um, I, went, I saw but, Nish Kumar the other day oh yeah and, and five minutes in he just went I know I look nicer on the MASH report yeah, and, yeah, like, exactly. and it was and it was weird because I've, I've never seen the MASH report I don't, I'm not, I'm, I've don't. i seen clips of it online but I don't, I'm not a, so it was uh, it was a weird one to hear him sort of go oh okay I, kn I know that they edit me and I'm calmer or whatever yeah but at, but at least with, with Nish it's like the, the MASH report is a comedy show so at least the audience yeah. who like that will you know will have some sort of similar so, similar expectation you know but i think with i think with someone like me it's not going to affect me so much because i'm not famous in the way that nish and paul are famous though so i don't think i i don't think anyone comes to my shows on the basis of me doing the paper review on sky news i, I would be really surprised if they did well no because we were talking at the start about people coming from social media and so i'm yeah. wondering whether a comparatively if, if you still ask i don't know if you still ask your audience whether they come still from social media or whether they are coming from TV I, and, whether, and how those two compare I don't ask actually but I get but I, I do get the sense that a lot of the audience for instance I've, my show this year I get the sense a lot of the audience are coming from because of Titania right. that's that's probably true or I have some people who are aware that I wrote half of Jonathan Pye for three years so they there's that but there's not many who are, were really that aware of that um so I don't know. Uh, I, I think largely in Edinburgh as well, it's people coming back because they've seen you in previous years. I mean, this is the seventh solo stand-up show I've done. So I, there are people who know my work here mm. who wouldn't know me anywhere else. You know, it's a bit of a bubble here, isn't it? So, um, yeah, so it's a combination of all, all those things, I imagine. Mm. 
Yeah, no, it, it's it's. I've spoken to a few comedians at this festival, especially for this podcast, and a lot of them got uh, medium to large size social media followings. Yeah, who say you know I'll, I'll do I'll do a panel show. And ask, you know, has anyone seen me on it? And no one will come. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Like, even if yeah. you do, like, a Mock the Week kind of thing, it doesn't necessarily translate no. into ticket sales, does it? No, but then when I spoke to... I spoke to two agents at this festival yeah. um, for, for the pod and one for my, my own stuff. And they were like, well, if you did the show, you'd have to burn that material. And I'm a bit like... But it doesn't sound like the people that are watching me there or would watch me there would come and see me live. Maybe so it's not. odd that they think burn it when when it doesn't feel like well, but having said that I suppose uh, Lou Sanders uh, you know she did a thing at the start of her show where she said anyone seen me before and it was crickets and then they said everyone anyone seen me from uh, from um, you know the Taskmaster and everyone went yeah right. so so it, I suppose it depends on what you're doing on TV yeah it does it does I don't I don't think anything I do on TV because what I do on TV is not comedic mm. so I don't think anything I do on TV translates into stand up comedy ticket sales and I, I'm not well known enough for that to make a difference are you are you doing this many different things because you because you want to have different forms of income and you want different uh, sort of creative outlets, or are you doing it because you're trying to stay afloat? It's not as calculating as that. I'm okay. I'm, I'm just I'm I, a lot like with a lot of this stuff. I just I do the work I want to do, and opportunities arise, and I take them. Mm. I, I, you know, you you can't end up doing this the sort of political commentary thing I do by design. You don't. You can't email. Uh, news outlets and say oh you should have me on because they'll just ignore you it's, I, 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 if I'm invited on I go and if I'm not, not I, I obviously I'm not going to that's it you know mm. I, I, I'm I've been asked this before like why do I do the very why do I do musicals and political commentary and stand up and you know why have I got two fingers in all these pies I suppose and it isn't a, 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 it's just that I do what I want to do when I feel like doing it and they're not always the same thing mm. And I suppose I also get bored of doing the same thing all the time. So I like to move on. I like to change things up. And, mm. I, you know, I don't I don't envisage doing Titania much more than another year or so. I, you know, I, I think things have to move on to keep me interested. Mm. And when you when you were writing for Jonathan Pye, the, the, so, so we all know as performers, we can workshop jokes on stage and, you know, try them yeah, out at yeah. work in progress nights or, or you know, comedy on leisure, where, wherever. For videos... It strikes me as a very different beast because you have to, you put it up and you can't really edit it out or no, change it. No, so you, how do you exactly. workshop stuff for a video? But it doesn't matter so much whether it all works because it's not you don't have an audience response there. It's not dependent on an audience response. Interesting. So like with, with, with the reason why stand ups have to have to refine their work so much is because of the nature of the audience. If you've got a well, you know this. If you've got like a three minute set piece and you're only getting one laugh there, you're gonna have to change it. You're gonna have to add detail. You're gonna have to mess mess around. If you do a three minute video online you don't need any laugh out loud moments actually mm. particularly with a character like Jonathan Pye where, it's, where if, if people like the view that's being expressed they'll share it anyway so, so the, but that's the difference when it came to writing the live shows for the character you had to have pretty regular um, you had a high gag rate you had a high laugh moment you needed that because you hear the response you don't do that with a video yeah, I, I get that, but I suppose you have another another form of feedback in the the comments and the and the, and the upvotes and things like that. I mean, did you did you ever read the comments? Oh yeah, but they're insane, aren't they? Like, okay. they're, like they're, if you read through, I, I stick off. So I, I don't really touch you. Oh, I, I, mean, I watch it, but I but I don't ever put stuff on YouTube because literally, just it's become the unless you were historically a YouTuber yeah. and you've got your own little base that kind of outweigh the idiots. Every time I put something up, you know, it would be it would be just ridiculous vitriol for no reason. Well, it's at all. either vitriol or and it's people. People do this weird thing where they just quote their favorite line. Yeah. Back at under, as, which is not. I don't get it. I don't get why anyone would. I, I would never. It would take a lot for me to comment under an article anyway. Mm. Um, but that strikes me as really odd. Um, and people say the weirdest things under those. You're best not to read below the line, to be honest. Right? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm going to say that I'm a bit of a hypocrite because people will send me messages on Twitter and they're obviously mad and idiotic, but I'll get trapped into talking to them. I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. And then after a couple of tweets, I realise, oh, this person's insane. Mm. Uh, and then you just walk away from it at that point. But, you know, um, but yeah, you do get that feedback. But that feedback's not really, that's not useful feedback. Not no. like not like an audience response is useful feedback. Mm. You know, not like um, uh, the sound of a, uh, you know, when when you when you land a joke and and it never fails to to get everyone laughing, you, you think that's a great. I know that that works, mm. and you, it works with different types of audiences and that kind of thing. That's really gratifying, isn't it? Mm. Um, but you don't need that with a video. No, 
completely. Um, so these are the last quick fire questions. Okay. Um, so I'll, they're quick for me, but you take as long as you as you like. Um, who was the first person to believe in you? As in to believe it, that I had any kind of ability. Yeah. Uh, that well, I suppose going back to oof, don't know. Uh, going back to school, I, I suppose. Um, earliest person teacher would have been either one of my early teachers maybe mrs appleby maybe mrs mckay yeah i mean she 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 spoke to my mother about something i'd written i was five i think and i'd written a story and she she uh told my mother that this was exceptionally good and and that i had some kind of talent here and it and it you know that i should and she sort of suggested things that i should read and things like that so maybe it's her okay that would make sense yeah. Um, what's one unpopular opinion you have about the comedy industry? That the a comedy industry establishment is essentially woke, I, which I think we all know is true, but it's definitely an unpopular opinion to express. Right. Um, a, lot, a lot of comedians would call themselves comedians, but they make more money from something else. Like they might have a day job or they might sure. be doing something else. How would you define yourself and how would your income define you? I'm a writer and comedian. I don't do anything else. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I, I used to be a teacher. I mean, when I started, I was working all, the, all through the day as a teacher and gigging at night. It's very exhausting. Yes. Um, but I, don't, I haven't done that for many years. So, I, you know, that's how I sustain my income is writing and comedy. Okay. Um, what is the biggest mistake you've ever made and how did you overcome it? It doesn't oh have to be a comedy mistake. It can be any mistake. Biggest mistake I've ever made? That's a really, really difficult question. Um, I mean, arguably, uh, I, I, I suppose it's, is it a mistake? I don't know. But I suppose the biggest mistake would be that I was such a lazy boy at school. I did no work at all. I was uh, very, um, I just relied on intelligence to get through. And actually, as a result, I underachieved massively. And I also feel like if I had just done a bit of reading, a bit of working, I think I would have had a much sol more solid grounding. Whether that's a mistake or not, you know, I, I, I feel like I was, to a degree, failed by the education system insofar as I wasn't disciplined particularly well. Um, and I do believe that autonomy in adulthood depends on effective socialisation as a child. Um, but I suppose I should take responsibility for myself as well. So a bit of both. Yeah, I, I, I think I was lazy. I think I, I, I felt like I was, when, when I was in my 20s, I felt like I was catching up on my education. I, 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 I felt like I was educating myself. I read an awful lot. I still do. I, 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 I feel like I was making up for lost time. And I, and I think that gra lack of grounding was a real wasted opportunity. Mm. Who do you think is the most underrated person in the comedy industry? Um, I used to say Victoria Wood. Uh, because although she was massively popular and successful, comedians rarely admitted to liking her for a long time, and then she died, and they all said they loved her. Um, but who would I say now? Now, I would say probably David Mills, who I think is one of the best stand-ups in the country, and for some reason is not a household name. I don't get that. I don't understand that. I mean, if you watch him do a stand-up set, it is mind-blowingly good the writing the style he's unlike any other anyone else you won't see anyone else like him and yet he's not as well known anywhere near as well known as he should be so i would go with him i think okay uh, he might just not want to be famous maybe not but but more people should know of his work mm -hmm. no, I'm just, yeah. yeah um what do you think is the biggest problem in the comedy industry and how would you solve it the wokeness uh the idea that the comedy is there to educate rather than to entertain uh, that sort of arrogance ab about the industry. I think that that's the thing that needs to change the most. Um, the idea that uh, the the belief that most comedians have or seem to have uh, that the public are really uh, these malleable things and that they 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 can't that they need to joke in a certain way. They can't. In other words, they don't trust their audience. They don't trust their audience to to get nuance, to get ambiguity, to get irony, all of that sort of stuff. I think is really sad and it comes out of a very snobbish uh, world view and it's largely because the industry is so middle class I guess well that, that is probably the origin of it um, but yeah that's the thing I've, I feel like if we could get over that the art it, it is it, it, it cripples the art form 
basically when 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 performers feel that they have to work within very strict parameters in order to be successful it means that no one takes risks anymore or, or very few people do and the people that do are punished for it i mean we know this don't we anyway we know we, old tweets get pulled up this week sarah silverman admitted that she lost a major hollywood contract because she performed an anti-racist sketch eight years ago which has nonetheless been taken completely literally by idiots um you know and the the idiots who take it literally no aren't the audiences right the audiences get that it was an anti-racist joke she wasn't blacking up in order to express contempt for black people and you would have to be genuinely amoeba level stupidity to think that but but unfortunately in the woke cult the woke movement it is a basic amoeba level level of stupidity and they and they take it literally and that's so that if we can get over that then we can have another golden age of comedy maybe mm. Uh, when was your first artistic scar or stumbling block and how did you get through it? I've had so many. Oh, you know, Pick uh, your favourite. Uh, blimey, <laughs> yeah. the first. Um, well, the, f- the first one that really stands out that, made, that pivoted you or changed something about your, your character or writing. Um, I mean, I've kept all of my rejection letters. From when I was like trying to write plays and get, and, and get plays on and all this sort of thing and sending stuff away. And um, I was constantly getting knocked back. I think, you, you know... If you don't come, if you don't have those contacts, if you don't have that, you know, you you just have to persist, basically. Um, I can't think of there's any one in particular. There are so many, but it's almost like a, a gradual death by paper cut situation. You can allow it to get on top of you or you can keep you can keep persisting. Um, once you learn that critics, for instance, are responding to a, uh, a fa- fashion, they are they are. One of the best ways that you can determine the fashion of any particular era is to look at its criticism, because what they are not, what they are generally doing, is just reflecting the fashion of the time, which means that they're often wrong, which means that it doesn't really matter what they say. Once you once you get past that, once you realise that, you become a bit more uh, bulletproof. Um, so getting knocked back, getting you know, I've had shows which have been hugely well received and shows that have been condemned, you know. Um, neither matters neither matters what matters is you're making the art that you believe in um but yeah those sort of knockbacks you learn to deal with it i'm I'm pretty immune to it now actually i think and because i'm so used to being uh attacked online by people who think i'm a nazi I've, 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 I've developed this kind of i mean i am a sensitive person you know i'm not i'm not going to pretend i'm not but I'm, I'm i'm sort of jaded with it i'm bored with it i don't I, I, it just doesn't mean much to me i you know so yeah I, I didn't really answer the question that's okay um, <laughs> so last two what's the best bit of advice you've ever been given the best advice i've ever been given was from my i had two supervisors when i was doing my doctorate at oxford one was Catherine duncan jones the other was robin robbins both brilliant scholars robin said to me whatever you do don't go into academia he said you'll end up an old man running around the quad screaming why have i wasted my life that was the best advice I got out. I mean, I was a part-time lecturer and I was spending most of my time in the Duke Humphreys Library, which is this ancient library in, in the Bodleian in Oxford, which is where they filmed the Harry Potter library. That's how old it looked. You know, the, the, the books are chained to the wall. They actually are. They didn't CGI that in. That is what it's like. And it's, and it's a dark, dismal place. And you spend your days in there trying to decipher early modern handwriting because I learned how to read uh, Renaissance handwriting and I would you'd spend half an hour deciphering something out of uh, out of some journal and it would be just some someone talking about their recipe for flan or some uh, you know something stupid like so it can be quite disheartening uh, and I also I think academia has become so politically uh, uh, conformist and um, there are such problems within universities uh, and also I wasn't enjoying it so I got out of it I was sort. I, I'd sort of decided that that's what I had to do because I was on that track and I'd been funded so much from by, by research bodies and stuff that I thought I had to do this. And and then I realised no, actually I can move to London, live with an elderly friend of mine, be poor, and do stupid stand-up shows. Fair. Last question: If you could go back to any point in your career mm. and give your past self one bit of advice, what would it be? It would be uh, never change your material on the basis of what other people think, ever, and never apologise for what you do. Uh, that's what I would do. I think early on I was doing that awful thing of trying to anticipate what would be successful. Once I got over that, then I started having a modicum of success. That that would be the best thing I could suggest to anyone. It, it just won't come. The inauthenticity of someone trying to, to chase the zeitgeist is, is off-putting. 
mm. I think, and people know it's happening and people sense it. So I think just, uh, yeah, honesty with yourself and uh, is the best thing for the creative process. Cool. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. That was Andrew. I loved hearing about his thoughts on social media as a tool to sell tickets, books, merch, as well as the value of creating a character who can say things that you can't and and creating different personas that allow you to explore comedy in different areas that you maybe were not initially able to because you can't say certain things on stage, just like he did with Titania. I, I loved hearing his, his thought process behind all the characters as well as the creation of them i really enjoyed it and i hope you got lots out of it as well i also think if you can you should look up comedy unleashed and maybe go and check out a show don't let the guardian or any other newspaper tell you what it's like i've done it i can tell you now i had a brilliant time and it it was lovely it was a really diverse crowd which is i wouldn't say a rarity in london but i would say that everyone sort of has their tribe whereas with this one it felt like there were so many different opinions in the room which was awesome to have so i knew when something landed it landed with most people that were in different groups and it was because it was funny not because i was preaching to my own choir which is so hard to not do in this day and age as i mentioned earlier there's a link to my book in the show notes how to make a living by working for free you can get a copy for five pound digitally it is a how-to guide on how to create your online audience and then monetize it by asking them would they like for you to continue to create things if so give them some money speaking of which if you would like to become a patron of the podcast from just one dollar you can do that right now there's a link in the show notes you can also do a one-off donation on paypal.com again there's a link in the show notes other episodes you might be interested in include the one with jonathan pye who andrew co-wrote with for i think it was four years three four years he used to write at the character online if you don't know jonathan pye or titania there are links in the show notes you can check that out as well you should also check out the podcast with richard herring about how he built his online audience to increase his offline audience and how he has now turned that into an entirely different model for someone as established as him he now has such a direct relationship with his audience and and gets so much more than he ever could have imagined by going direct to them and being funny and and asking them to support him it's such an exciting episode i highly recommend you go back and listen to it the ask the industry podcast is a fruit that got in gravity's way production for the internet all elements were created by me comedian simon kane thank you very much for listening thank you very much for subscribing and thank you very much for rating and donating if you do i'll see you all in about 14 days time bye